senhores, é com grande prazer que a Faculdade de Filosofia e Ciências Humanas, o Centro Brasileiro de Pesquisas em Democracia e o PPG em Filosofia e o Grupo de Pesquisa Interdisciplinar em Neurofilosofia do Instituto do Cérebro, recebe mais uma vez o professor Barry Smith para fazer uma apresentação sobre os sentidos. O professor Barry Smith a, trabalha no Instituto de Filosofia que ele coordena na Universidade de Londres, onde também a, fundou este Centro para o Estudo dos Sentidos, que é um trabalho a, interdisciplinar em a, neurociência, ciência cognitiva, filosofia, psicologia e linguística. Depois de suas publicações em a filosofia da linguagem e filosofia da mente, o professor Smith tem trabalhado especificamente na área de olfato e de sentidos. Então, as suas publicações estão no site, que inclusive disponibilizamos para esta semana. Ele editou várias publicações importantes com a Oxford University. University Press, incluindo Questions of Taste, The Philosophy of Wine, então é uma área ah, em que ele é particularmente pioneiro no estudo da filosofia do vinho, ah, The Oxford Handbook of Philosophy of Language, também da Oxford University Press, ah, Knowing Our Own Minds, também da Oxford University Press, e tem a desenvolvido várias pesquisas ah, em áreas ah, correlatas, mas particularmente filosofia da linguagem, filosofia da mente. Well, welcome once again, and uh, we hope uh, you enjoy your stay, two days stay in Porto Alegre before you go back to Europe, and uh, please feel free to use your time as you wish. Obrigado, Nitamar. Uh, Muito obrigado uh, uh, e muito prazer. That's my Portuguese. <laughs> now I start speaking in English. Thank you very much uh, for coming. It's very good to be here. I want to talk a little bit uh, to you about flavor uh, and uh, really issues about tasting and taste because, one, it's a very neglected topic. Many people think of it as something simple, something easy to explain, and yet I think we're beginning to find out, mainly from work in psychology and neuroscience, just how much is going on in this area and how important it is uh, if we're to understand the workings of our senses. So if we're studying the senses, we think of touch, taste, smell, sight, hearing. People often start with five senses and they think of them as working independently of one another. These are individual senses. So what do we mean by taste? Well. The word taste is very complicated, it means many things, so we might talk about the taste of the chocolate. So we might talk about a, a particular um, property of the things that we're eating. And if there are tastes in food, how do we recognize them? And then when we're eating, what gives rise to these experiences of tasting? How do they occur? Which bits of our uh, uh, apparatus, sensory apparatus, are we using to have experiences of tasting? Well. Many people ordinarily think that taste is a very subjective experience. It's something that happens because of sensations on, in the mouth, on the tongue, that's it. And we tend to think of taste as immediate, intimate, personal, uh, and it's transitory. You, you sit or you bite something, you have an experience, it's over, it's passed very quickly. And people also think it's not contestable. So people will say, this is just how the wine tastes to me. So it's just my own experience. And taste usually has a hedonic valence to it. So you either find it likeable or not. You say, I like it, I don't like it. Very immediate. But tasting itself, what sort of experience is tasting? Is it a simple or a complex experience? And how do we know about it? Do we know about it just because uh, we're immediately aware? Or do we actually have to do some science to find out about how tasting works? Well, first thing to notice is that tasting involves more than the tongue. 
And I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about that. So when we taste things, we think we're getting most of the information from the tongue, but in fact, very little information comes from the tongue, very little. So I, I have some props. I wonder if I can enlist your help. I don't know if I've got enough for everyone, but at least the first few rows, if you would take one of these candies, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's breakfast, but if you take one of these candies, I'm going to get you to do a demonstration. Uh, so what I, what I want you to do is I want you to, I want you to unwrap the candy and have the, have the piece of candy in your, in your fingers. Don't eat it yet. Please don't eat it until I say, because we're going to we're going to do this together. Somebody in the front row needs to try this. You have a have a go. All right. So the surprise the surprise is that most people think that they're getting information from the tongue. So if you've unwrapped it, have you got it? Have you got it in your hand? Are you ready? What I want you to do when you when you have this in your hand is with your other hand I want you to close your nose. So I want you to pinch your nose tightly shut, okay. Now you have to hold the nose shut first. Before you put it in the mouth, you have to have the nose closed, okay. So the nose is closed, there's no air going in at all. Now keeping the nose closed, put it in your mouth and start chewing. You've got to keep the nose closed first. And then put it in the mouth and start chewing, okay. You ready? In it goes, come on. Nose, nose pinched first. Keep the nose pinched. It's not deep sea diving. It's not difficult. Okay, you don't have to go. <gasps> Nothing hysterical. Okay, okay. Keep the nose. Keep chewing. Keep chewing. Put it in. Yeah, yeah. Now let go of your nose. Ah, now you get the flavour. Okay. So what happens, as you've experienced there, is that all you're getting from the tongue <coughs> is a little bit of sweetness or maybe a little bit of sourness. But when you release the nose. Now you get the fruit flavors, now you get strawberry, now you get raspberry, now you get lime. You don't get those from the tongue. So all you get from the tongue is the following. Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, savory, or umami, as the Japanese call it, and metallic. We know you have receptors on the tongue for metallic. So you can taste the kind of metal sensations you get when you taste your own blood. You can taste that in the mouth. But that's all you get. But think of the flavors you can actually experience. You can taste ripe mangoes, fresh figs, lemon, cantaloupe, melon, raspberries, coconut, green olives, ripe parsimon, onion, caraway, parsnip, peppermint, aniseed, cinnamon. You don't have receptors for those things. They are not coming from the tongue. So when you have experience of any of those flavors, that has to come from somewhere else and it will come from smell. So we don't get everything from taste, and notice you cannot make those flavors by combining the basic tastes. So if you think of the taste of onion, how do you make the taste of onion? You can't say, well, take salt plus, and then think of other receptors. You won't do it. So most of that is smell. So all you get from the tongue is gustatory sensations. Now I said you've got maybe six basic tastes. It's uh, still open to doubt. Some people say seven, some people say six. Uh, seven would happen if we've got receptors for fat. It's controversial, I don't think we have, but the evidence seems to say that we have at least receptors for fatty acid, so we can tell when there's fat in the food. But we almost never experience pure tastes except under clinical conditions. It's very hard to take away smell, you have to hold the nose and you have to remove all air traveling in the mouth in order to get pure taste. It doesn't happen very often. And notice how easy it is to confuse taste and smell. So if I give you a piece of uh, vanilla, a vanilla pod to smell, you'll say it smells sweet. But sweet is a taste, it's not a smell. And in fact, if you ate the vanilla pod, you'd realize it was bitter. So notice there's no sweetness in vanilla. Why does it smell sweet? It's an association. It's the fact that you combine that odor and that spice with foods that have sweetness and that uh, activate the receptors on the tongue. So here you've got an association between taste and smell, but you have got no, you don't smell sucrose. It doesn't actually have, there are odors associated with it, but pure sugar itself doesn't have a smell. All right, so here's a clinical way in which we confuse taste and smell, Linda Bartoshuk and colleagues. The use of the same word taste to refer to flavor and to the true gustatory sensations of salty, sweet, sour, bitter, leads to a variety of confusions. For a clinical example where patients lose olfaction, 
They often report they cannot taste or smell. However, when questioned, patients acknowledge that they can taste salty, sweet, sour, bitter, but nothing else. Now, the nothing else, as she says, is the contribution that retronasal olfaction makes to flavor. So this is important. A lot of people will present to doctors and they'll say, I can't taste anything. That's their first awareness of something having gone wrong. But a good clinician will put some salt on the tongue or some sugar. Can you taste that? Yes. So you haven't lost your taste. They've lost smell and they didn't realize that smell was playing such a big part, such a huge part in what happens. Often, um, loss of smell is terribly important and many medics don't pay attention to it, uh, which is a problem. And of course, loss of smell happens for several reasons. It can happen with head injury, where you get a shearing accident here and you cut the, uh, the receptor sheet of the olfactory epithelium. But also with neurodegenerative diseases, the loss of smell is often, as many of you know, a, a, an indicator, an early warning sign that something is going wrong. And patients will sometimes present strange symptoms. They'll say, uh, orange juice smells of fish. Uh, they will have these hallucinations or illusions of odors. Uh, so uh, a woman who was talking to me about her condition said that uh, this, this, this smell of fish means that it contaminates food. If she drinks her coffee in the morning, it, it tastes bad. She can't drink orange juice because it tastes uh, fishy. She overcomes this by having a little piece of smoked salmon in the morning and then when she drinks her coffee, she can convince herself that it's just the lingering taste of the smoked salmon that's there in the coffee and it allows her to drink. But smell is very, very important and it shouldn't be neglected. Okay, so we've said that strictly speaking, taste is exclusively the upshot of these uh, receptors firing. And you've got taste receptors in the mouth, you have some in the nose, and you've got taste receptors in the gut. Taste receptors in the gut are important because it will uh, measure sugar intake, which is a regulator for insulin release. So um, taste receptors are not just in the mouth. So what does the tongue contribute? Well, we live in different taste worlds. Um, if I had the tasting strips with me, uh, I would give you them. Uh, they're soaked in PTC, uh, phenylthiocarbamide. And by putting a tasting strip on the mouth, a little piece of paper, you get three reactions in a room like this. Some people say, ah, oh, it's very bitter, and they have to take it out of their mouth immediately. Some people say, it's a little bit bitter, it's a little bit like an aspirin. And other people say, you've given me a piece of paper with nothing on it. And those are the non-tasters. So you have non-tasters, tasters in the middle, and then so-called super-tasters. Now, if you look at the, the slide on the, uh, on the right, Super tasters have got very dense packing of papillae on the tongue. Their papillae are closer together. And then you have them a little stretched out for normal tasters and very far apart for non-tasters. That will determine how much salt you like in your food. So um, there's no point in having arguments with your friends and with your family and saying, you know, too much salt. No, not enough salt. You might live in different taste worlds. So if your papillae are close together, what makes something salty is how many receptors are simultaneously touched by NaCl molecules. If your receptors are far apart, you need to spread the salt a lot to get the same level of saltiness. That's also interesting because at the moment, nanotechnologists are working on trying to create salt molecules that will unwrap themselves and simultaneously touch many receptors so that you can quarter the proportion of salt intake and still get the same salty experience. Uh, so this is a, a, a very good way and a, and a healthy way of um, removing uh, the difficulties of, of large salt intake. All right, so we've said that all the other flavors you're, you're talking about, if they're not salt, sweet, sour, bitter, savory, and metallic, they're coming from smell, all of these things. Now we need to distinguish two senses of smell. And that's why it's rather hard to notice that smell is involved, because we tend to think of smell as, uh, as we ordinarily experience it, as taking odors from the environment into the nose by inhaling. But there's another sense of smell that goes a different route, and that goes not from the nose to the epithelium, but it goes from the mouth to the epithelium. And there are the two routes you can see here. So um, notice that you have exactly the same uh, odor volatiles 
going to the same receptor sheet, the olfactory epithelium, but by these two different routes, retronasal through the mouth, orthonasal through the nose, and they project to slightly different uh, pathways. So the same receptors in the olfactory epithelium are activated, but depending on the direction of airflow, they project to slightly different cortical sites. And that results in two very different sorts of experience you can have of the very same odours when you get them through the mouth or through the nose. So, um, for those of you, and there are many of you in the room here, are some of the different sites. So when you've got retronasal perception of chocolate odour, you get preferential activation in the uh, in this uh, medial, <coughs> in the medial uh, uh, orbitofrontal cortex, whereas you get it in the uh, lateral when you have it orthonasally uh, instead. You get some slight differences uh, elsewhere. Um, regions of the insula are more involved in uh, orthonasal olfaction than in, uh, in retronasal olfaction. All right. Now. So now we know that an odor molecule can reach the nose through the olfact uh, can reach the olfactory epithelium through the nose, and it's treated as coming from the environment. But when you get an odor sensed uh, from the mouth, it's treated as uh, a taste, and that's actually crucial because it shows you that these two senses of smell are doing two different things. You could think of evolutionary reasons for having two senses of smell. So one sense of smell is the orthonasal, is to give us information about the environment, predators, smoke, food sources, mate selection. Retronasal olfaction is more like a, a way of assessing what you've just eaten. Do I want any more? Should I stop? Is it good? Is it bad? It's a sort of immediate quality control on what you've, you've taken, and it tells you whether to accept it or not. Think of what happens when you swallow. When you swallow, you pulse huge amounts of odour up into the nose. So swallowing is why you get the big flavour hit. As soon as you do that, mm, you've got a pulse, you get that direction of retronasal olfaction that gives you uh, flavour. Now, the interesting thing is that when you experience the smell from the mouth rather than from the nose, you don't treat it as a smell. You tend to experience it as though it's occurring in the mouth. Because when you taste strawberry or mint or lime or chocolate, and we told you you don't have receptors for those, you nevertheless think you're getting that flavor from the tongue. So there's a location illusion. There's a referral of sensations. So what's happening is that you're getting uh, a sensation that should be uh, a sensation of smell in the nose, but it's getting experienced as though it's occurring in the mouth. And when you have an aftertaste in your mouth, that's really an after smell. But again, it's treated as though it's located in the mouth. So there's a, there's a problem we need to explain. It's not clear, we don't know yet how to explain oral referral. Why do you get sensations that should be smells turning up and experiences that are occurring in the mouth? Now, many people thought it was just due to um, the location of uh, the food. It's the fact that the food is in the mouth and they thought it was touch. So you might think, if I'm experiencing a smell and I'm experiencing a taste and I'm getting touch on the mouth, I'll just locate everything to the mouth. That might be what's going on, but um, I'll say in, in a few minutes why that's not, that's not enough. All right. So, although we talk about taste, the experience of flavor, as Martin Newman says here, is actually a complex interaction effect. It's at least an integration, a fusing of taste and smell. Taste and retronasal uh, olfaction are getting fused into a single experience that's, that's as if happening in the mouth. Now, it's a complex interaction effect and yet it's a fusion of these different sensory inputs and yet uh, our experience is so unified it gives us very little understanding that it is actually a combination of different senses, right? We don't experience it that way. It's just a gestalt. It's just a single unified experience, and yet it's coming from these different sources. So we can be wrong about our own experience, uh, and we need to do a little bit of science to find out what gives rise to that experience. Okay, now, let's go back to this idea that uh, you get different cortical projections 
uh, after you've sensed a volatile odor in the nose or from the mouth at the olfactory epithelium. And uh, Paul Rosen, the psychologist who uh, dis first described these two senses of smell, he was really interested in two sorts of pleasures associated, two hedonics associated with these different smells. So orthonasal olfaction gives you the pleasure of anticipation. You go into the kitchen when somebody's cooking, you smell, you think, ah oh, yes, uh, food is coming and uh, it smells good and you're, you're getting ready, you're starting to salivate, you're, you're, you're anticipating. When you then eat the food, you're getting the pleasure of reward, you're able to assess how good or how bad the flavours are. And of course, these can mismatch. You can find that the pleasure of anticipation is not the same as reward, it can be less, it can be more. And here are some examples. Think of a very smelly French cheese. Think of a poisse. Think of one of those cheeses that starts to run off the table if you leave it out of the, the refrigerator for too long. It smells disgusting. You don't want to eat it. You don't want to put it in your mouth. It smells like a teenager's training shoe. It's got <laughs> isovaleric acid. It's very pungent. And yet, and yet, if you're brave and you put it in the mouth, it's fine. It's creamy. It's nice. It's very enjoyable. So here you've got a mismatch between the pleasure of anticipation, which was very low, and then the pleasure of reward, which is high. Now it can go the other way too, and my favorite example of the other way is coffee. When you smell freshly brewed coffee, it smells great, wonderful smell. You, you smell that aroma, you think, ah, wonderful. But aren't you always a little disappointed? It never quite delivers the same impact when you put it in the mouth. And that's because the uh, volatile aromas projected retronasally to the olfactory epithelium are doing something different than when you smell them coming airborne from the coffee. Manufacturers know this. That's why they say wake up and smell the coffee. They don't say wake up and taste the coffee, right? It's all about smell. It's all about aroma. Okay, now the one food source that has a perfect match in terms of intensity and uh, hedonics when you smell it orthonasally and retronasally is chocolate. Chocolate, the pleasure of anticipation, the pleasure of reward are matched. Beautiful, the brain's very happy, very satisfied. It's anticipating, it gets it, it's all good. So as well as all that sugar and fat and vanilla, it's also because it's got this nice, uh, equally matched uh, olfactory profile. All right, so we know that we know that what we call taste is in fact flavour, and it's got this inseparable connection between taste proper, gustation, and retronasal olfaction. But we have to add to that for, for eating, because we've got somato sensations in the mouth, you've got the creaminess or the oiliness or the stickiness of something, you've got the mechanoreceptors that are firing when you chew to tell you whether something's hard or the meat is tough or soft or tender and you've got trigeminal irritation. Trigeminal nerve is terribly important for food, and the trigeminal nerve uh, is the, as you know, is the facial nerve serving, innervating the eyes, the nose and the mouth. That's the one that goes crazy when you have too much wasabi. You have too much mustard, where do you feel it? You feel it there, right, yeah, 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 I feel it in the nose, not in the mouth. So you feel that and the eyes start to water because the trigeminal nerve thinks it's being attacked. The eyes are being attacked, so it floods them. So there you've got the, the um, there you've got one of the hidden senses of flavour. It also is the thing that makes peppermint taste cool in the mouth. So it makes mustard taste hot. It makes peppermint taste cool, even though there's no change of temperature in the mouth at all. Uh, slightly different with capsaicin because capsaicin's got a double hit. Capsaicin is not only giving you trigeminal irritation, but it's also giving you local oral burning. That's why you know exactly on the tongue where the chilies have been and on your fingers, right? So, you know, you have to be careful. So there you've got somatosensation, trigeminal, but you've also got um, uh, retronasal olfaction and taste. So now that we put all of those things together, you see how many elements are involved in a simple experience of tasting. Here's, here's an obvious example. Take the flavor of menthol. It's got a minty aroma, a slightly bitter taste, and a cool sensation in the mouth. And if you take any one of those away, you've lost the flavor of menthol. So notice that you've got touch, taste, and smell integrated always. So tasting is one of the most multi-sensory things you do. 
it's one of the things that the brain really has to put a lot of effort into. It's got to take information from these different sources, it's got to fuse them, it's got to give you a single experiential delivery. It's complicated. So this is not this is not trivial stuff. This is a lot of work's going into this. And when you get these elements put together, they tend to get most activation in a multisensory area like the OFC. So it's usually in the orbital frontal cortex that you get the the, the combining, and there you also get hedonic elements, whether I like it or whether I don't, whether it's rewarding or not to have this. So when people say to me, oh, taste, it's uninteresting, it's very trivial, um, why, would the, why would the brain be doing so much work and using so many sites to put this together if it was so trivial? It's because it's essential for getting key ingredients, nutrients that you need, that's going to keep the brain alive. You're also going to have to guide successful food choice, whether things are toxic and you don't want them, whether they've got uh, enough sugar in them, whether they've got too much. You're going to have to do a lot of assessment of the quality and input of your food selection. And so that's why the brain is doing an awful lot of work to put that together. And all you get is this single experience which happens very fast and you say, I like it, I don't like it. Now there are many interactions between the senses involved here. Um, one of them is the way smell enhances uh, taste. So when you, when you are tasting, suppose I give you sucrose solutions and you rate them for sweetness and you're pretty good at it, we test you, you're pretty good, you've got good ratings. Now I give you some of the same sucrose solutions but with the smell of vanilla or odor, they will taste sweeter. And what happens is you actually get higher activation in uh, the, the taste receptors for sweetness, the sweetness receptors, when you're getting it combined with vanilla aroma. Why is that? Well, it's often because you're combining vanilla in the cuisine, in the food sources that you're taking with sweet things. You put it with custard, you put it with ice cream. But notice that because you get sweetness enhancement, you get boosting, you can use less sugar and get the same hit and that's actually quite important because that means that uh, vanilla ice cream makers know this. They can use lots of vanilla and much less sugar. So again, saves you on health. Good thing, eat vanilla ice cream, it's good for you. So here, here you're getting something, but it's culturally specific. There are certain cultures, like um, in Thai cuisine, where you tend to mix vanilla with salt and with fish, and you will not get vanilla smelling sweet. Instead, you'll get an increase in salt reaction. It's very interesting, in some Southeast Asian uh, communities, they will smell whiskies or bourbon and they say, I like the saltiness of them, and the makers are very puzzled, there's no, no salt in there. Uh, and I realized it was because of the vanilla, because the vanilla gives them a salt association, they get salt enhancement, and then they think, oh, this is because it's a coastal whiskey and, uh, and it works, and the advertisers are happy. Okay. So you get odor-induced tastes, but you also get taste-induced odors, it's bi-directional. Just to show you, it goes in the other direction too, uh, mint and chewing gum. If I give you some chewing gum just now, uh, mint chewing gum, you chew, you chew, you chew until all the flavor is gone. Now the moment when the flavor is gone and it just tastes like a piece of plastic in your mouth, if you take it out of your mouth and you roll it in a little bit of icing sugar and you put it back in the mouth, now you have mint. Why? There's no mint in icing sugar. So what's happening is that you're getting mint that was below the level of detection, below your detection threshold, gets boosted when you get the association with sugar. So again, you can have odor-induced tastes, taste-induced odors. So there are interactions between these senses. Here's some other strange interactions. Touch and smell. Uh, the touch and smell areas are actually uh, connected to, in a way we didn't used to know. There is an aroma in shampoo that makes your hair feel softer. So there's a sort of green apple aroma. And when that's in a shampoo, it sensitizes your fingers and you do this and you think, ah, oh, it's lovely, it's very soft. Well, that's also important for eating because if you can use odors that make what's in the mouth taste creamier, you can reduce the fat content. So in yogurt, low-fat yogurt research has given us huge amounts of useful information. So people try to reduce the fat in yogurt, and people say, ah, I don't like it, it's watery, so then they put in some glutamate, and then they say it's gluey. Mm. So now what you can do is you can use certain aromas 
which give you that creamy softness, smoothness in the yogurt. And creaminess is interpreted as sweetness by the brain because of, again, a cross-modal association. So if you have something that's very creamy, you think it's very sweet, double cream doesn't have any sugar in it, but it's tasted as sweet. Okay, so there are interactions. So what we now know is that we don't want to treat the senses so separately. We don't want to divide up the senses the way people thought. You know, you look at psychology textbooks even today and you still have people saying, oh, here are these different senses, there's vision, there's touch, there's smell, there's hearing, and we know where they are, there's the somatosensory cortex, here's the primary taste cortex and so on. They're not, they're much more multisensory. These areas are working together, they're interacting to produce the experiences that we think of as just seeing or just hearing. And there's some rules of how the sensory information is combined. One is sensory dominance, the other is when things are occurring in the same place, space and time, they often get bound together, and then semantic congruence. Let me quickly just tell you about these three. So, take sensory dominance. When you're in the movies, you think the voices are coming from the actors' mouths, but they can't be. That's a screen. So the sound is coming from the side of the movie theatre, behind you, under your seat, but what's happening, of course, is that you're getting visual capture of auditory attention. Because you're seeing mouths moving on the screen, and that's coordinated in sync with the auditory input, the brain simply does a trick of relocating the spatial information about audition, and it relocates it to where the, the visual information is, and it's as if all the sources, visual and auditory, are coming from the same location. That's the ventriloquism effect. Very, very useful. But you also get sensory dominance in flavor research. So some nice work done by Charles Spence in Oxford, who I work with. Um, you give people these, uh, these colored drinks, and they're tasteless. But they are convinced that the, the green colored drink tastes more sour, and the red drink tastes more sweet than the others. So here you've got visual information dominating uh, uh, sensory information from taste and smell. So color and flavor have these uh, sensory dominant properties too. Smell and sound, are they connected? Well, if you get people to smell odors, perfumes, uh, they're very happy to say, oh, this is a high note. This is sort of men men menthol, it's very high, musk, that's very deep, that's dark, and if you give them uh, musical notes and smells and ask them to pick which ones go together, they think there are some that are congruent. Now we use this in flavor perception because we know that people prefer to, to associate bitter flavors with low notes on brass instruments and they prefer sweet flavors to go with high notes on say a piano. Now there's a chef called Caroline Hopkinson in London who does this very cute work where um, in her pop-up restaurant she makes a sticky toffee pudding and it's bitter and sweet and beside your pudding there is a telephone number and you pick up your mobile phone and if you dial one number and you play the low notes and you taste the pudding it tastes bitter and if you dial the high notes and taste the pudding it tastes sweet and this works so this is very strange why there should be connections between sound and flavor, but there are, and then we can play with these. So what you're seeing in these interactions is, of course, super additivity. So if you, if you see a plastic bottle being crushed, you get activation in visual areas, of course. If you hear a plastic bottle being crushed, you get the auditory activation. But when you see and hear them happening at the same time, you get more activation than you get from the summation of these two inputs. So the brain pays attention to certain combinations. And why does it do it? Because probably it says these are coming from the same event. Pay attention. These are happening at the same place. And so you mark it. So it's a way of paying attention to objects and their properties. So we know there are many sensory aspects of integration. Now the question is, does that mean that flavors are just a construct of the brain? Maybe there are no flavors in food. Maybe the chocolate doesn't have a flavor. Maybe it's only when the brain does the clever thing of putting touch, taste, smell together, it integrates this information. Maybe that's where their flavor is. So, so flavors might just be in here. That's the standard neuroscientific view. Here's Dana Small 
having read um, Gordon Shepherd's book on neurogastronomy, and she says, flavor is in the brain, not the food. It's the brain that integrates the discrete sensory inputs from the food and drink we ingest to create flavor perception. This is not a sensible thing to say because it doesn't distinguish, and it's very hard, I have to say, to get my colleagues in neuroscience to make this distinction, doesn't distinguish between flavor and flavor perception, or color and color perception, or sound and sound perception. They're different, okay? So, what she's right about is, yes, you need the discrete sensory inputs from the food to make a flavor perception, but it doesn't follow that flavor is just flavor perception. Flavor perception is how we lock onto flavors, it's how we identify flavors, it's how we try to track and find those configurations of properties in foods, which count as the, the ones that we care about and like and want and try to track for the things that we need. It's not the same as to say flavor just occurs in here. And the trouble is, if you think flavor occurs in the brain, you now have to tell me which things go into flavor binding, which things go in and which things don't go in. Now, here are three definitions, uh, we don't need to read them. The most important thing to notice is that they all have different ideas of what goes into flavor. Hmm. So the first one, which is given by AFNOR, the International Standards Organization. It's called the International Standards Organization because it was invented by the French, so it's international. <laughs> as far as I want. The language of God. Okay. So they tell us, they tell us that uh, flavor is olfactory, gustatory, and trigeminal sensations. Charles Spence and Malika Overy tell us all that, but they say, as well as touch and so on, maybe more. And then Bartoshuk and colleagues don't have touch in there, they say it's just taste and retronasal olfaction. That's it. It's just these, just these two things. Then there's the how question. How do you bind these elements with combinations or blends? How do they go together? So we need to answer the what question and the how question if we're to understand why we come to have flavor perception, why we come to have a percept. And what role does any component play? So the tactile sensations are supposed to do the combining in the first one, and most of them think touch does the combining. And how do we get unity? Is it because of spatiotemporal unity? Is it because the things are happening in the mouth? Well, we know they're not all happening in the mouth because we know the nose is involved. We know that we're using retronasal olfaction. So why is it that there seems to be a unity? This is hard to, to, to say. I think we want to use this important distinction between multisensory integration, where information from different inputs combines to produce a novel, uh, a novel uh, level of activation or a novel uh, 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 set of um, uh, neuro, uh, neurons or groups of neurons. So here, where we've got fusion, you often get uh, information sent from some sensory areas into a multi-sensory area like OFC, just as you do with SDS uh, uh, and others. Contrast that with cross-modal effects. Cross-modal effects are where you have activation in one sensory modality influences a level of activation in another, but they don't get bound, they don't get put together. So when you smell vanilla aroma, you get an increased activation in taste uh, receptors, but it doesn't mean that you have to put those two things into a single product, right? So, which things get bound and how do they get bound? Why do we bind the sensory elements we do? Everybody knows what's going on in us when we're tasting something, so we're not losing information about all that's happening. But notice you have disagreements among the scientists about which things belong to flavor perception. Now I think one thing that I can say, and I, I, people who say flavor is, the, is in the brain can't say, one thing I can say is we can use the Warren and Welsh assumption about multisensory integration or binding. Multisensory integration takes place when there's an assumption that that information is coming from the same source. It makes sense to have sounds and sights put together when they're from a common event. Face perception and voice perception tend to be mutually reinforcing in the fusiform gyrus. That's right because uh, 
it's good to have face and voice information connected. There may be people who look like you but don't sound like you. There may be people who sound like you but don't look like you. But the chances of somebody sounding and looking like you are very slim. So that's good for tracking individuals and persons in the world. So when you have a common source, it makes sense to treat the information as bound together because it's coming from a common source. But if you don't have anything like flavor out there in the world, flavors are just created by the brain, which things do you bind? Which elements do you put together? Why don't you put together everything that's going on in you while you're eating? The temperature of the body, the vestibular system and its sense of balance, why don't you put everything in there? And I think there is a problem for people who make flavors in the brain because they, they, they don't know where to stop. Do you want to put hedonics in there? I don't. So some people will say, look, um, you have a hedonic element, you, have, you eat something you say is delicious or you say is disgusting. Is that part of flavor or is it just a response to flavor? I think it's a response to flavor but it's happening at the same time. So one of the things you could say is uh, this, we might distinguish the hedonics of eating from taste, tasting or flavor perception. So the whole experience of eating involves flavor perception, but it overflows flavor perception. It involves more than that. It involves how nice it is, it involves the, how, how happy you are, you're sitting in a restaurant, you're with friends, you know, you're feeling very relaxed. That's all the pleasure of an eating experience. But flavor perception is about assessing the qualities of flavors in foods. And that's only part of the overall experience. If you think of the crispiness of an apple, when you bite an apple, you get that nice noise. Is that noise part of flavor perception? Well, it's not so good if you don't have that noise. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we know that if we put headphones on you and we make slightly different noises when you're eating, you'll be disturbed. But that doesn't show that it's part of it. It's part of the overall hedonics. It's not part of flavor perception. So we should exclude it. All right, so neuroscience tells us what's going on, but it doesn't settle the facts about what flavor is. And I think we need a distinction between what is constitutive of flavor, what's a component of it, and what's merely causally affecting flavor perception. Which things are parts and which things are just influences, okay? Causal uh, influences versus constitutive components. And that matters to philosophers because whether you're having an illusion or whether you're having genuine perception depends on what it is to perceive flavors. If sounds are part of flavors, then if sound affects what we taste, then that's a perfectly normal flavor perception. But if sound is not part of flavor, then you're creating illusions by giving us sounds. All right, so to show you why this matters, and here's this distinction, causal versus constitutive, to show you why this matters, just ask yourself, what, what should go into flavor and what should be left out? Here's another nice experiment with my colleague, Charles Spence. I've got two bowls of yogurt, and exactly the same yogurt is in each bowl. But in one of the bowls, I put a little weight at the bottom, okay? I give you one bowl of yogurt, try that, mm-hmm. I give you the other bowl, try that. I say, which yogurt is richer, creamier, more luxurious? It's the heavier one. Do you want to say the weight of the bowl is part of flavor? What about color? Would you eat that strawberry? So there's a question about color congruence. Do you want the color of your food to look right, usually? So here's a nice experiment done by Wheatley in the 70s. You can't do this experiment anymore um, because you can't get it through the ethics committee, but I've tried to persuade a TV producer to do it because there's no ethics in television. <laughs> uh, so, Quigley did this nice experiment. He, he's got people in a room with ultraviolet light and they're eating steak, peas and fries. And they're asked to talk about the quality of the food. So they're eating and is, is the meat well cooked? Is it tender? Is it tough? How are the peas? How are the fries? Now they're paying attention because they're talking about it. And then he changes to normal lighting and it looks like that. So the steak is blue, the, the fries are green, the peas are red. And, and many people involuntarily retch. Right? They, they, they find themselves immediately disgusted. So should we say there's such a thing as visual flavor? Do you want that in there? What about sound? So um, Charles Spence and his colleague uh, Zampini did this very nice uh, work for which he won the Ig Nobel Prize. 
with, uh, <laughs> with uh, he was uh, with Pringles. So you're eating Pringles, right? And Pringles are an experimenter's dream because they're all identical. You don't have to control for the shape; they're perfect. You leave Pringles outside the box, and they don't taste fresh. They go stale. Nah, not very nice. You know, soft. But. With hungry undergraduates eating these, when you put headphones on them and you give them the Pringles that have been sort of left outside the box so they're soft, if you amplify the high frequency sound of their own crunching, they taste fresh again. So that's interesting. And in fact, Charles did this work for Unilever and that's why they make the bags so noisy. They make the bags noisy to get the brain ready, fresh, fresh, all that noise. <laughs> In fact, there was a bag in Texas that was a hundred decibels, and it was it was banned. <laughs> okay. uh, sound is also this is something I think you know very well. Um, uh, food tastes lousy on aircraft, and they tried a lot to help, and there's a reason for that, and it's because white noise diminishes your taste perception. So if you've got white noise in the ears, your taste discrimination is low, uh, and and. Even though they try to make the food better, people say, nah, it's horrible. But they give you noise-reducing headphones in business class, and people say, oh, the food is much better, right? So you're, you're taking away that interruption. Uh, Heston Blumenthal, uh, 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 Michelin star chef in London, uh, who works with Charles Spence, um, they, they realized that the trigeminal nerve isn't affected so much. So in British Airways, you're now making the food taste spicier. And people say it's better because that's not affected by the noise. Uh, so there's ways of compensating for loss by trying to add other sensations into the mix. But do you want to include these? Do you want to include sound and vision in, in flavor perception? Why not? If you're thinking that flavor is made by the brain and they're having an effect and they're occurring at the same time, why not put them in? But I think they don't affect, uh, they affect the overall experience of tasting, but they're not part of flavor perception. They're things that can bias or distort or influence flavor perception, and we can show that in the lab. So I don't think you want that in there. So I think you want to distinguish between flavor and flavor perception. And for me, flavor is a technical term. It's used to describe the sapid, odorous properties of a solid or a liquid, including properties of its temperature and texture as well as the power to irritate the trigeminal nerve. And it's when you have configurations of those properties in the foods, then they're going to be the things that stimulate different senses, and if they're in the right configurations, they will lead to the right integration of that information in us, and by those perceptions, we will keep track of what's out there. But of course, we can miss what's out there because we can have psychologists doing very naughty things and influencing our perception and putting uh, sounds in our ears or giving us different lighting and that means we can miss it but flavor perception is a way of keeping track of flavors flavors are objective so um, in conclusion I would say that um, flavors are in nature and new flavors are made by chefs and not by brains but we still need to know a lot about how flavor perception works if we're going to explain how we, with the brains we have, manage to keep track of and identify the flavors we do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Such a profound and uh, thought-provoking talk. Well, any questions, comments, please, Fabricio? Um, I, I was really interested in your distinction between flavor and response to flavor, Professor. Yeah. And throughout your talk, I, I kept on thinking on the question of anticipation and disappointment yes. as it relates to flavor. And then I will just use your grammar, response to flavor. It seems to me that you would include both in response, as, a, as in terms of response to flavor. And I was thinking of coffee, for example. Uh, the way in which you can qualify Arabica or other sorts of coffee as better than others, it seems to be a lot, in a great deal associated to your anticipation of the flavor. Same thing with cheese. If you've had that cheese before, you won't anticipate it as bad tasting, because you've had it before. Same thing with sushi. Sometimes you've had a bad experience, you've had bad sushi, so you anticipated it to be lousy, right? 
but then I wonder if this would be under the umbrella of responses to flavor and not flavor in itself. So that would be my first question. Yeah, if anticipation and disappointment would yeah. enter a response to flavor mm -hmm. in your grammar, mm -hmm. or if they are integrated within flavor. Yeah. No, they're definitely about responses. Okay. They're definitely about responses. So I think you shouldn't have the hedonics in flavor. So um, it, it's very easy for people to make that mistake, and they think, um, I mean, children think, you know, broccoli is disgusting because when they eat it, they might not like it, and then they think the disgustingness is in the broccoli, it's sort of part of the broccoli rather than just a response they have to it. Now, if those hedonic properties were parts of flavor, how could you ever acquire a taste for something? Because what happens when you acquire a taste is that uh, you didn't like it, and then you do. None of us, to begin with, liked the taste of alcoholic beverages, but you know we kind of do now, um, and we had to make ourselves do it. And, and it's not hard to see why. You're a teenager; it's the adults do it, gets you drunk. But but the question is, do those beers that you didn't like at first, do they taste different now? Probably not. If the chemical process of making them was fairly stable, they're going to be the same taste. So why do you go from liking to not liking? It's it, You need a story about that. Yes. Right? You do need a story. But the story I think you need is that the way you experience them differs. But when, when you say the way you experience them differs, that doesn't mean their flavors change unless you identify the flavor with the experience. Uh, would you mind going sure. back to the technical definition you gave us just yeah, in the previous sure. slide? Yeah. So uh, one, one thing that I was, so I was anticipating that you would qualify the question of anticipation and yeah. unfulfillment of the yeah. experience of taste within disqualification of response. But then, uh, and I was wondering how you would define it, but then one thing that I am quite interested in is the question of texture. Yeah. Because the kinetic experience, how does the kinetic, the kinetic experience can move away from the experience of anticipation and fulfillment here? Uh, it seems to me that it's also connected to the history of your previous kinetic experiences with that. For example, when I got a candy and I saw and I touched it, I could qualify, I could anticipate that it would be at least a little bit sweet because I could feel that it had sugar in it. But again, that presupposes my previous experiences with candy with sugar and that I know that sugar is sweet because of my previous experiences with sugar too. That's true, but we could fool you. I mean, in fact, sure. uh, flavor, flavor perception uh, researchers use something with the texture pretty much like the candy you had, but they have, they have color and they have no flavor. And then what they do is they give you this and then they spray some odor around it. And you put it in your mouth and you chew and uh, you then have a flavor and people cannot be persuaded they're not getting the flavor from the candy even though uh, if you pinch the nose and you eat this uh, completely tasteless jelly you realize it's got no it's got no tastes at all so um it's true that i mean look what you're pointing out is that there's a lot of work to be done and it is being done on how our expectations shape what we taste and they shape the hedonics of it okay. so um nice work done by martin yeomans and heston blumenthal where he made a smoked salmon ice cream mm -hmm. now you've got smoked salmon ice cream and you give it to two groups of people one group are told here's a novel flavor of ice cream i want you to rate it for liking for creaminess for saltiness sweetness and the other group are told this is a frozen savory mousse no prizes for guessing who likes it and who doesn't. The ice cream people, they don't like it. The frozen savory mousse people, they quite like it. But the interesting fact is that the people who are told it's an ice cream, they rate it as saltier than the other group. So that's interesting because that's a distortion of their um, basic receptor response to the food source because they're anticipating sweetness, and then when it's uh, counter to that, then they, they, get a, they get a different discrimination. So, of course, there are impacts on it, but I want to say that those are ways in which we mislead people. It took a lot of work to create this experiment. It's not, it's not a natural food source. So, you draw a distinction here between the experience of flavor, the experience of yeah. taste, and flavor. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Absolutely. And just a, a very, like, Specific question: Are you familiar with Grant Ashat's 
No. Uh, Grant Ashatz is a chef in Chicago. He has this restaurant, Alinea. He yes, has tongue yes, cancer, yes, and he lost yes. all the all the sensibility in the tongue. Yeah. And one of the things that is most fascinating about it is the way in which he has continued to have one of the best restaurants in Chicago, yeah. and the way in which he has described the way that he does food has changed yeah. after yeah. the tongue cancer. And then he describes taste patterns in terms of touch, in terms of smell, but and after your qualification, I don't think it actually interferes. It's, right? it's not as bad. Um, so, so I, 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 I now know who you mean. Uh, yeah, he, um, he lost uh, taste proper. He lost gustation from the okay. tongue because of the, the treatment for, for tongue cancer. But, but it's not good, but it's not as bad as losing your sense of smell. Of course. So he's, he's getting all the uh, odors and he's also getting the, um, the touch and texture matters. But here's, here's what matters, because I didn't get to that point, I should underline it now. People think that you bind odors to the mouth by touch alone, and it's not true. We now find out that you need a tastant in there. And not only do you need a taste and it's not enough just to have texture in the mouth and a smell. You need to have a, a taste and which is nutritive, something the body needs. So, and that's very interesting. So if you give people, if you give people um, a, a jelly in the mouth and an odor, but there's no taste, they, they, they tend to think they're just getting a smell and something in the mouth. But if you give them uh, an odor, and a taste and, and a texture in the mouth, then you get flavor binding, then you experience something in the mouth. This is new work done by um, Juan uh, Lim and colleagues, which I just heard about last week at a food science conference in Rio. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Questions? Comments? <coughs> is there any relationship with how hungry you are? How good is something tastes? Yeah, um, but, but that's sort of interesting because uh, uh, I mean, many things will have a, an impact on your flavor perception, as I've now been finding out from, from this wonderful conference in Pangborn in, in, in Rio. Saliva rates have an impact. We all have different saliva rates in the mouth. Um, incisor pressure, a uh, huge variation between us and between uh, us and Eskimos, who've got enormous force and capacity in the in, in bite pressure, probably because there's a lot of raw meat uh, consumption. Hunger will have an impact, but but there's something which I think is more slightly more interesting than hunger per se, and it's it's stimulus specific satiety. Ed Rolls and colleagues did this in Oxford. So suppose I give you a piece of chocolate and you like it a lot. Uh, and I give you another piece of chocolate, uh, and you like it, and I give you a third, and then there's a moment where you say, you know, enough chocolate, and I say, no, the experiment must continue, <laughs> and I keep giving you, and I keep giving you the chocolate. The hedonics go way down, mm -hmm. woof. But it's not because you couldn't eat anything. If I switch and say, would you like some cheese, you say, ah, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> so it's um, stimulus-specific satiety. And the interesting thing about that, that matters to me because of separating the hedonics from the flavor, because while I'm doing that to you and the hedonics are low, if I gave you a slightly different chocolate, you would notice it. So in other words, your ability to identify the, the intensity and the quality of the chocolate remain constant, even though you're getting variation in the hedonics. So, you know, it's nucleus accumbens that's, that's kind of changing there. But hunger will, um, hunger tends to give you keener anticipation but it also gives you um, keener perception. It's true. So as a professional wine taster, when I go to visit uh, wine domains, the best time to go is 11 o'clock in the morning, it's sufficiently after breakfast, it's before lunch, you've got a little bit of hunger, your perceptions are very keen, your palate is not short by a day of eating, that's, that's the time. If you're going to visit really good winery, go at 11 o'clock. Everybody wants that appointment, right? Um, and then it seems as though you, you, can, you can almost sense that your uh, perceptions are keener, they're faster, they're more acute. Uh, later in the day, uh, especially if you've been tasting all day, the wines at the end of the day taste great, but you don't want to buy them then. <laughs> Excellent, really interesting talk. Thank you. I was wondering what type of uh, relationship you are working on or whether you're working on a relationship between the 
perception or the percept of unified experience in the mouth related to taste experience and the percept of unified experience of thought in, in the brain or in the head. Yeah. Is there any type of analogy that you're working on that, uh, on that level? I think there's something, there's something kind of to be got there because whenever you get these intersensory gestalts where something is kind of, you know, um, pulling information from all these different elements together and, 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 and seemingly unified, then it seems to be a sort of key component for a concept, for conceptualization, for classifying, for individuating from other things. So there's, there's, there's a way in which our terms in language are probably going to track uh, these unified elements because they're easier to to anchor in experience, they're easier to rediscover, re-identify, to label. And it's certainly about labeling. I mean, when you think of, people say, well, we lack the names for tastes and smells, but we use the objects. So we talk about strawberry or chocolate or milk, or we use the objects to name them. But it's interesting that that name is simple. It's just simple, raspberry or strawberry or mango. But it actually stands for something we experience in a multi-sensory way. And we don't use many, many terms. So I think whenever you get those unities, those sort of gestalts, that's the point at which language is really useful to have a single term to kind of label it, track it, and, and, and put it in relation to other things. There's still lots I want to work on when I think of the difference between uh, perception and cognition about these things and the relations between perception and cognition are very difficult and, uh, but I, I just think philosophers have missed a lot about perception and to think that we're using our senses separately, individually is a mistake and that if you try to build your structures of the mind on false views of sensory perception you know the rest of it's going to be wrong if it starts in the wrong way here. So that's why I want to start here and know more about the science, figure out what we should say about perception, and then work on to thought after that. Right. Right. Can I just follow up on that? Yeah, and I'm wondering about the, the experience of, of taste as opposed to yeah. the experience of flavor as opposed to flavor. To what degree do you attribute uh, a linguistic reconstruction yeah. of the experience yeah. as playing a role in that, yeah. uh, that experience. So it, 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 the linguistics is interesting because um, remember the smoked salmon ice cream, if you, call it, if you call it ice cream or if you call it frozen savory mousse, those linguistic descriptions have a huge impact on what you are expecting and how you deal with it. Um, and I do think that, that there, there's an issue here about whether um, uh, different cultures using slightly different linguistic classifications might actually have different flavor experiences. Whether, I think they're tasting the same flavors on occasions, but whether they're having different flavor experiences. So there's a kind of Worfian hypothesis to explore here about how we categorize and taxonomize uh, experience by the influence of language. And also, once we have words, then we start to use them as um, stereotypes uh, to, to, to reach for. So in wine, wines are, volatile, live, changing, they change in the bottle, they change in the glass, they change with temperature, and yet people like to reduce it to Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Cabernet Sauvignon. Now when you've got those labels, then you start to simplify and it's easy to try to eliminate an awful lot of what is actually going on. But in fact, tasting a wine, an interesting wine, a wine worth your interest, is a continually changing dynamic experience and so the language tends to obscure that and make us think it's a simple single momentary thing so beware of labels cool thank you Barry. i'm wondering how are you why are you so interested in, in making a point about flavor as a property because for all the things you've said, the interesting part is always connected with our experience, mm -hmm. yeah. which is very complex and connected with many different things. Uh, of course, 
it's, it could be, it would be a philosophical scandal to admit that it's only in brain, like Kant said, and nothing is in reality that uh, provokes something in us. So from that perspective, okay, there must be something there in reality which uh, provokes the sensations and the perceptions, but we could treat uh, those as properties. And, but why to yeah. be so specific and say, that flavor there, there yeah. is flavor there. I, I, I'll tell you why, and it's, it actually does bear on my interests in wine, because wine tasting is hard, and yet everybody believes it's easy. Um, I give you a glass of wine, I, and then I say, what do you think of this wine? And you will sip it, and you'll say, oh, I like it. And then I'll have to say to you, no, I didn't ask that. I asked, what do you think of it? Um, tell me about the wine. Now it's a little more difficult. And it turns out that because people have got a mistaken view about flavor and they think it's there all at once, it's just identical with whatever experience they're having, then they can say wine tasting is entirely subjective and it's entirely a matter of you know each individual's reaction. I don't think that's right. And I got interested in this as a philosopher because wine critics all say wine tasting is entirely subjective, it's an individual matter, and then they tell you this wine is better than that, this, this domain is better, this is a better vintage, and you say, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, you can't both say it's all subjective and then start telling me which thing is better. So, um, I think that there are objective properties of flavors and they're actually very difficult to get hold of. You have to do work, you have to have training, you have to pay attention. And so, here's, here's what I think. I think that uh, you have chemists, analytic chemists, who are talking about the chemical properties of the wine, they're talking about uh, isoamyl acetate, ethanol hexoanoate, uh, sotamol, you know, they're, they're telling you all the things that are in this, this liquid. And then you've got the psychologists who are telling you flavor perception is always varying. If we change the lighting, if we change the music, it's all different. And these guys can't see how to connect what they do. And yet, you know, people are spending a lot of money on wine chemistry to improve, to get it better, to, to get the level right. So what we need is something in the middle which is called flavor. Now there are two tasks. One task is to explain how does the chemistry, how do these chemical molecules support these, um, the, these, these properties that are emergent and depend on but not reduced to the chemistry. So you've got this job of going from the chemistry to these, these uh, emergent properties of flavor. And the other job is to go from perceptions of flavor to flavor. How, how do we in our limited apparatus, influenced by mood, by hunger, by time of day, by context. How do we get at what flavors are? So you've got two jobs. You can't try to unite the perception with the chemistry immediately. You need something in the middle. So I think that's why it's important, because I think you, you, you will have a better explanation of the whole journey from using signs to improve vinification, viticulture, creation of wines of quality and establishing what it is to, to create a better wine and then you'll have a story to tell about how, you, how we have to work to get at those properties. So that's why I want flavors in between. There's, there's, it's not just um, philosophical dogma, I think it will make a better explanation of what we are actually doing and of some of the puzzles and the challenges of why tasting is hard and why there's a science of winemaking. The science is a science in the service of producing a better experience in you, right? So this is classic mind-body stuff, it's core business for philosophy. We go from, you know, what's going on in the physical world to what's going on in, in you mentally, right? It's got to be mediated by brains, it's got to be mediated by, by physiology, it's got to be mediated by all sorts of factors. But just to leave everything in the, in the subjective, or to be more uh, scientific these days in the brain, I think that's, I think that's a mistake. I think we will, we will lose explanation, explanatory power, which we can have if we introduce flavors as objective correlates of, of taste perception. 
one of the great things about listening to you, in, in my perspective, is that it, it gives me lots of ideas in terms of uh, and desires to connect that with, with morality. I think there is lots yeah. of things yeah. that can be connected. Yeah. And it's actually that point is one very interesting because by reading your definition, I couldn't uh, have the full concept of being in the middle, flavor being in the middle. I will give you an example, then you can uh, confirm that. Uh, in morality, you, we can say uh, a moral fact is, is a fact, in the sense that it's, it's somehow in reality. But of course, it's very hard to believe that, because moral evaluation is something very complex, and just yeah. like flavor. Yeah. So we need something in the middle. So not to be like a realist in terms of moral judgments, are made uh, through because of reality in that sense, but of course it's not independent of reality quite a lot because it would be like uh, be deluded. I, I don't know. Right. So I love your concept, but yeah. looking to that, would you say that flavor would be this uh, to use this uh, um, black uh, uh, concept quasi realism in terms of? Of what is the you could be a quasi realist or, que or things, queasy, yeah. queasy realist about, yeah. um, about this, but I, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy to be objectivist and realist about flavors. I oh. think they're there, um, but they're not simple. But I think wherever the brain does multi sensory integration and creates these unities, it's usually because the unity assumption is that we're keeping track of something that's there something that, that's in the environment that it's important for us to track and, and find and relocate and so on. So um, that's why I think there are flavors, because I think that's, that's why we have got the unification going on, rather than thinking, the brain just made them because it thought it would be entertaining to have a cocktail. You know what? Give me all that stuff and let me see what I can do with it. And, and each one of us would come up with our own subjective color portrait. Why would we do that? The rest of the senses are doing a job of trying to make sure, taking multiple inputs simultaneously from the world, that they give us a good take on what's going on out there and help us to mediate our environment and track and deal with it. I don't think that flavor perception, taste and smell should be any different. So the idea is that people have always thought this was just something, you know, entertaining and individual, idiosyncratic, like synesthesia. I don't think it is. Not at all. I'm as realist as you get about flavors. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, exploring the question of uh, Adrian, Adrian's question. Uh, uh, let's see the, 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 the definition of flavor. You uh, say that flavor is a technical term, etc., but uh, it is the power, uh, it is as well as the power to irritate the trigeminal nerve. Yeah. It's, it's so it remembers Locke's conception of secondary qualities and etc. Uh, and this is, uh, let us say, metaphysically, uh, as I understand, a kind of a realistic explanation of reality. And so, uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, thinking about what you said, uh, I was wondering if it's similar to, uh, you remember uh, Wilfred Sellers fusing the image, uh, the idea that if we, have, we can have a scientific uh, description of uh, the world, but we have also a non-scientific description of the world that is a common sense description of reality. For example, uh, uh, persons and people, environmental environments and, and, and our common sense perhaps sometimes uh, biased or yeah, it's, it's the manifest image in the scientific image. Yeah, the mani uh, yeah, manifest image in the scientific image. That's what Sarah's yeah, thought. Yeah, that's an idea. Yeah. But, the, but, my point is that uh, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, we have reality there, we have some things in our, in our brain and we need some kind
kind of intermediate position, you said something. This is not exactly what it said. Uh, the point is how, uh, uh, how to understand the idea of uh, secondary quality as something in there, not inside us. Uh, uh, let me let me just stop sorry, you and right. say it's a big topic to decide what the metaphysics of secondary qualities are. But I think powers have got categorical bases, so I'm not too happy with Locke's idea. But I, I, it, it would be a big job to do the metaphysics of all this. Main thing, the main thing is just to suggest that we don't have to reduce flavors to flavor perceptions. And we don't have to see flavors as somehow difficult to accommodate in the world. They're actually rather complicated things to get at, they're configurations. And it's because they're configurations that we need uh, multiple senses in us to get at them. Now, common sense is not a good guide to this because common sense tells us taste is a single sense. It's wrong. We've given up our views about the world containing just five elements that Aristotle told us, but we haven't given up Aristotle's view, we've only got five senses. If you ask most people, they'll tell you, oh, we've just got five senses, and they all work independently. What's up with that? We need to revise that view. This is a way in which common sense is really out of touch with what's going on, but we need to do the science to find out. Okay, well, uh, once again, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.